Well, thank you. So the crazy thing here is, at the end, number one, uh, I'm standing. I was literally in my bed last night putting this together uh, with a huge fever. Um, and I, my topic here that I'm covering is not my core of what I do on a daily basis. I have to follow uh, two tremendously passionate guys, uh, Mark, who I know and love. I can see why, Mark, you're hacking Steve Jobs. This is, I'm going to roast you a little bit. Did you borrow his shirt? <laughs> you dressed this. Day. I love it. I love it. That was totally awesome. Love it. Love it. Uh, but I, I'm kind of here to um, explain the e-currency myth. So but as I do that, it's, 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 a, it's a great topic for me because for most of my career, I've been hacking uh, or, or dispelling myths about certain things in multiple industries. Um, I was blessed with a very fortunate background that a lot of people find weird or interesting. Uh, my, my father's side of the family is kind of a, a middle class, uh, working class corporate. He was a PhD in nuclear physics, uh, which is pretty normal. Uh, in the world, and my mother is from a gangster family. So I got to grow up uh, really seeing the value of academic smarts and street smarts on a daily basis and trying to figure out which one meant more, when in the end, as I turned 30 years old, I was like, you know, they're both they have an equal, uh, equal opportunity for us to grow. Um, so having those two things in place, it, it makes it very simple for me to see what the hustles are in the world and then to be able to figure out why they work, how they work, and, 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 and how they're working or working for us or against us. Um, so how many people in here are entrepreneurs who own their own business? Wow, very high number. This is great. How many of you take credit cards for payments? How many of you take cash for payments? Wow, so few of you take cash. How many of you take wires? Okay, love wires. That's good. How many take Bitcoin? That's the sound of crickets. Okay, so I'm going to dispel that myth right away, right? So everyone here is going to ask about, you know, uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and all those things moving forward. But let me dispel the e-currency myth in one click. That's what it's about. E-currency is nothing more than a conveyor belt or a system that takes cash from one person to another. The reason it's called e-currency is because it's now electronic. The old format of this, in its original state... By the way, everything that has to do with currency. So a little bit about my background when I go into this. Uh, I was a, a trader by nature, coming up out of school, uh, an entrepreneur through college, did a lot of things in college that uh, uh, you're probably not supposed to do. Like I you know, partied a little bit too much one night and went out and bought six lawn mowers and started a lawn care service, right? I ended up buying my house in college for that. Um, but throughout that entire process, I said, wow, the financial services world, this is where I wanna go. I wanna be a trader and a money manager and this is a great world. What I realized was, at the end of the day, I was trying to become the ultimate middleman. We deal in a world of middlemen. The electronic world has created multiple middlemen and reduced the size and the value. And, and, and I love what you said about uh, uh, the wealth and being able to give back and what makes worth. This is where e-currency has a bit of a problem in translating to the common person is what e-currency is and how it works. We started out using wire transfers. That's how you know we originally went to you know Pony Express and put some money in a duffel bag and give it to a guy, throw it on a horse, ride across the country and hand him that money. Hopefully, it'll all get there. Uh, all those guys had risk risk mitigation processes in place. They already knew if I gave a guy back then a lot of money, a thousand dollars in a satchel, that about nine hundred of it would probably get to its final destination, and hopefully, my debt would be you know forgiven from that point. Um, then we went into wire transfers. Wire transfers were done in the early 1900s. Long time, you know, long time ago, hundreds of years ago, we started doing wires. They were done in a different format than we see today. The middleman was a bank, right? The banks are the ones who took the clip. Middlemen are the ones who take a fee to do something that you maybe could possibly do on your own if regionality and, and, and communication weren't hurdles. Uh, then we went into the Western Union, the money transfer systems. These now were non-banking corporate operations that basically came in and said, you know what, it's kind of like a wire transfer, except it costs more. But we guarantee it'll get there on time, and the amount of money you deliver will be uh, from one party A to party B. Right? Very simple process. We understand you're paying a fee. Then we went into what we technically call e-currency today. Right? It's no different than uh, the traditional model of a wire transfer or a Western Union. I'm basically saying, yeah, I, I, Jay, I owe you X amount of dollars. Let me hand you the cash. Well, I'm not close enough to you to hand you the cash, so let me use my phone or my credit card and let me get it to you, right? Either way, it doesn't matter how we get there. As entrepreneurs, I do want to note one thing as we go through this presentation. E-currencies, middlemen, banks, all these things, who do they cost in the end? Does it cost a customer extra money to use these middlemen? They don't cost us, right? 
you lose 3%, 1.5%, 7%, whatever it is in the end, Western Union actually was the only one who was charging the customer, the sender, not the receiver. Uh, the receivers generally are the ones who get clipped, right, in the credit card business. Uh, and then, of course, the, the random evolution into the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency world, which I'll go into. I'm sure that's the main topic people want to cover, and I'm going to cover it very quickly because it's a very uh, small topic in general. Now, the history of this, the idea of digital currency, what approximately what year do you think that happened? Best guess. When did e-currency or digital currency first hit the radar? If anyone has a guess. I was astounded to find this out. Very good. Yeah, 1983. Uh, is it... Is it this is before co computers actually communicated with one another. They were just individual computing devices. Uh, and then this is another astounding thing. So Google, by the way, uh, just became eligible to drive a car. If Google was a human being, it just turned 16 years old and it could actually get a driver's license. Doesn't it feel like it's been around for about 100 years? Right? It's a staple. So is PayPal. PayPal was founded in 1998. This is really not that long ago. PayPal was really the first person to take e-currency and make it a reality, basically by saying, you can give me money and I will give it to them, right? I'm a middleman. Upload it to PayPal and I'll deliver it over here. This is what e-currency is. That's the myth. It's nothing magical or mystical. Uh, it's, it's not a new trading platform. We can turn anything into a trading platform. I'm a former trader. Anything can be a trading platform. Advantage of a few hundred million dollars, anything can be a trading platform, uh, including celebrities. I know there's a Hollywood stock exchange here in, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, but with e-currency, we also drifted into multiple types of, of, of middlemen who've been created, Skrill and some of these other platforms. Don't get me wrong, they're tremendously useful. We couldn't deliver money from one point to another in, in the digital age without them. Uh, well, we couldn't previous. So what's coming out, we will be able to. Uh, then we moved into mobile currency, being able to pay on the fly, right? So we went from basically saying, I've got to ride a horse to get there, just to I can push a magical button at the bank, it'll get there, uh, to eventually saying I'll use a computer to get there, but I have to be near a computer to use it. As they became mobile, so did payments. Moving past that, we then went into the Google Wallet era where there's multiple cards and multiple places. We can, you know, all these things are just new ways of doing the same exact thing, delivering money from one way to another with a small fee attached. Um, now, Bitcoin. This is an interesting thing. I know everyone here has asked me about that. Uh, Bitcoin first started in 2009. So also, it's actually been around a lot longer than most people think. Uh, the currency fluctuation has been pretty crazy. I don't know. Who, who thinks they know a lot about Bitcoin in here? awesome, then I'm actually the expert in this room. That's cool. That's a good thing. So that's about as far as my knowledge stretches there. Uh, no, just joking. Uh, E-currency and the basics. Again, it's just sending money from one place to another electronically. Now, the more security that's being created, security is the absolute key to e-currency. Without security, there is no need to send things electronically. You're starting to see a lot of the stuff pop up in the newspapers with Target being hacked. Yeah, newspapers, dude, I just did it myself, right? Uh, on blogs and the internet and your uh, content delivery systems. Uh, but you're starting to see these things become more prevalent in the world, right? Target's hacked, Albertsons is hacked, all these places are being hacked in their payment systems. But if you notice one thing, they're not stealing money. What are they stealing? Yes. So I would argue at this point, which I wanted to argue a little bit later in the, in the presentation, that the new currency that's actually of value, that's actually a real currency, is data. I'll make that very, very uh, clear in the end. Uh, now, with, with, with centralized and, and, and non-centralized uh, platforms, I'm going to explain these to you very quickly. So with e-currency, a centralized platform basically means, in, in real people terms, that the, it's, not, it's, it's, it's got regulations, but it's not FDIC insured. There's no SIPC insurance behind the money. I can tell you this from a fact because I've had PayPal seize hundreds of thousands of dollars from a business of mine because they felt like it. That was their answer. Well, we just need 30 days to figure it out. Now, in a traditional banking system, there has to be protocol followed and a reason behind this. You should know, everyone sitting here, that any type of e-currency, unless it's done through a traditional bank or even some of the credit card vendors, is just simply a centralized system. It's not a regulated system. You follow? So it's not maybe as safe as you think, uh, but it's also not as dangerous as you think also. Now, decentralized, and the reason I put half a cowboy on there uh, is because it is half cowboy. Uh, decentralized currency is completely the Wild West. Um, there is no one watching it. It's self-monitored and self-regulated. It's a complete, um, you know, cluster. I'll leave the, le the rest off of that. But for regulation purposes, uh, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a cool thing because there is some danger behind it, even though it's a cryptocurrency. Bitcoin does have some issues. Um, now, all of these systems operate in open-loop networks. 
An open loop network is this. You have a credit card, everyone here has a credit or debit card in their pocket, I would assume, and you can use that pretty much anywhere you want, right? No problem. You get assessed a fee for all the money you borrow if you're using a credit card, and you pay that annual fee or the monthly fee, and the merchant pays a fee to accept the money. An open loop system is a network that basically says this card can be used anywhere, just to keep it very, very simple. With, a, with an open loop network, it's ease of use for the customer and it's ease of acceptance for, for merchants. If I accept Visa, there's lots of people using Visa, so I might as well use Visa. If any of you have ever run credit cards for a business, you would understand how, how, how much difference there is between each one of these, especially with American Express, right? Um, you know, people, the, the old slogan from American Express, you know, talked about the, you know, ever being everywhere and used everywhere. Um, well, that was fairly mafioso uh, at the time because American Express cost twice as much to the merchant to accept it, but they did a big marketing push to make sure everyone used it. This is the hustle behind currency as a whole. You're being told credit card, use your credit card, use your debit card, use your PayPal, use this. These are marketing frequencies that they're digging into our neurons and consistently embedding into us and saying that this is the way the future is and you should do this. What you're not seeing is the ripple effect that's coming down the, the, the pipe from all these small businesses being dinged three and 5% every single day. Imagine if you got your paychecks or the checks that you write to yourselves and you went to the bank and you were charged three to 5% to get it. That is what happens in any sort of e-currency uh, or open loop network. Now, just to go through the, the model and the system and the way it works, there's a customer, there's an online store, there's a, a payment gateway and a payment processor. Does this already sound corporate and redundant? Do you need someone to process something through a gateway? Do you need two separate people to do these things? Probably not, right? Shouldn't technology be bombarding that and making that simple? This is where the largest opportunity in technology lies, is the elimination of credit card gateway and payment processors. You can eliminate those, Good luck. Uh, you're gonna need about 50, 60 trillion dollars to do so because you have some of the biggest titans in the world that love this space because that's where they make their billions. Um, but in that area, those are the ultimate middlemen. Two people putting their hands in every cookie jar of every transaction made around the world. Now, the e-currency breakdown, the middlemen process. Here's how it works. Let me play that again for you. Here's how it works. You see this? Pretty cool, simple animation. This is what e-currency or merchant currency does. Let me just do it again. Okay, see that? Real quick burglar, Pew. let me steal this 1%. You'll never even know. But by the way, you get to use it everywhere. You following? Now, Bitcoin, now that we understand that whole open loop process, the open loop system, Bitcoin. Bitcoin was created in a very cool manner. Man, do I love the idea and the, and the basic formation of Bitcoin. For those of you who don't know, Bitcoin started with mathematical equations. I'm all about it. I'm actually uh, ramping up a program with uh, Perimeter Institute in Canada called the Algorithm Academy. I believe in that mathematics will solve the entire issues of all the world. I totally support open source science, open source math. What they did with Bitcoin to make it very cool is they said, great, we're gonna allow you guys to solve these problems much like a miner, they're called Bitcoin miners. Guys who solve mathematical equations, there's a certain amount of currency that was created and every mathematical problem you solve, it's like chipping away and digging up a little bit of gold, which is why the Bitcoin symbol is, is gold and not green. Um, but these miners is how it all started. You can't get Bitcoin, you couldn't get Bitcoin unless you could solve mathematical problems. That's purity. That's Little League Baseball, right? That's not steroids in Major League Baseball. Eventually it got tainted along the way. Uh, and it's being tainted now. So once you, uncover, once you solve a mathematical equation, one, it started out as one. One math, mathematician or scientist or coder or engineer would solve the problem, get a Bitcoin. Now they had currency, but what do you do with it, right? You're not walking around this, the mall and saying, we can, accepting Bitcoin, no, right? Like, I, I, you have yet to see that. When I do, that'll be cool. I don't think it'll come, uh, and a lot of experts agree with me in the fact that uh, the, whole, the whole Bitcoin model is really fantastic for virtual goods but that's as far as it'll go, although 80 to 90% of all the companies that are creating Bitcoin businesses are designed around creating a Bitcoin ATM. It's not gonna happen, guys. Um, now we have networks, which I think is really cool also. So multiple engineers and mathematicians can now work on these problems, and now they can divvy up the bounty. It was a bounty system. The system was pure and was created for this cryptocurrency. Now cryptocurrency, I don't need to explain to any intelligent people in this room here what crypto means, 
Uh, but it's a way of basically transferring money without having to put your social security number. Without, you can hide the money. I'm sure you've all read the stories about Bitcoin being used for prostitution and drugs and all these crazy things. It's also being used for some very non-dark enterprise systems like philanthropy. Nobody talks about the fact that you know four and a half million dollars was donated to cancer research through Bitcoin. As much as I'm not a fan of the model, uh, there are there are some great things happening with it. But the relevancy it has in the real world here is a great. It's a great uh, cocktail conversation, but the relevancy it has in the real world is very small. So I uh, don't want to spend a tremendous amount of time on it. Now, from the business perspective, from the entrepreneurs who are in the audience, there's a big danger. There's a big supply and demand. Uh, I mean, uh, Bitcoin is completely created on supply and demand. Maximum 21 million Bitcoin will ever be issued. That's kind of the mandate that was created. And of course, since it's crypto and open source, it can be modified. But right now, that's where it stands. Uh, currently, there's 13.5 million Bitcoin in the world. That's the number. So the supply and demand is there, which means when you have supply and demand, it can be controlled. Has anyone here ever played with trading a penny stock? Right? So a stock that doesn't trade very much, you can go in and spend 5,000 bucks for a two cent stock, and you just bought 100,000 some odd shares. And when you do that, the price of that stock goes from two cents to like 15 cents. And you're like, wow, I just made a killing. Problem is nobody else in the world wants to buy it. So you just made 15 cents of nothing. Right? So it's kind of the same thing with Bitcoin. So the more they take off the market, the more expensive it gets. And you can see it's gone from uh, 1,600 uh, Bitcoin down to 350 is what it is today. So a lot of people have lost a significant amount of money that nobody could actually determine how they could spend it in the first place. But it's a very nice gaming system. Now, the future of currency, e-currency, real currency, it doesn't particularly matter, is data. What's coming down the pipe? And this has been around for about 20 years. Uh, I was part of the first team to bring the closed loop idea off from Australia, which is where it originated, Ireland and Australia, where it originated, bring it into the US, uh, a closed loop system. You're starting to see this. It's uh, ironically, uh, uh, William Quigley spoke about this last weekend. I've been in the space for about, about nine years now. Closed loop networks, anybody know how they work? Anybody heard of them? Awesome, this is perfect. A closed loop network is a pretty interesting model. Um, Show of hands, I, I mean, it's the end of the day, so I'll just get us moving around a little bit. I'm the sick one, by the way, so you're getting super low energy from me. Uh, show of hands here, who shops at The Gap or has shopped at The Gap? This is LA, but put them down. No, don't let anybody know. I know it's LA. Who here shops at, uh, for non-clothing at Target? Okay. Who uses Shell Gas? It's like the same hands, right? Who has kids? Toys R Us? Okay. A closed loop network, these things are all predetermined, right? I go to Target, I can pretty much, I, I started, I had my own TV show years ago, uh, I don't know why someone gave it to me, but it was called The Ripple Effect. And I could basically explain to you how not paying your credit card funded terrorism, logically, proof and fact driven within two minutes. And one of the things that was pretty interesting about that whole show is the fact that I was doing it to promote um, a debit card diet for, for consumers. Something I follow to this very day, I have a debit card in my pocket today, it's fixed spending. So years ago, before I even got into the space, I used to talk about, you, you know you're gonna spend X amount every month, every week on certain things, put it on a card, when that card runs out, guess what? Fruit Loops and uh, ramen noodles, right? If you're trying to live your life that way, you'll actually hit your financial goals. So the closed loop networks kind of work in the same model. So you're starting to see a lot of these things work. Here's how they work. Closed loop network allows you to, instead of spending credit or adding debit to your account, it allows you to upload cash, free in general, depending on which loop you use. Maximum fee I've ever seen is one dollar. You might pay one buck to upload uh, your stuff to a card. From that point, where's that computer? Yeah. You get a membership card or a loyalty card. These are virtual, mobile, printed, cardboard, written with crayon, doesn't matter. You get a number, you use it in the system. Within that system, there are certain merchants who accept this payment process. This is actually, if you, it sounds familiar to any of you who understand finance, this was American Express's original, original model, right? Which is what, kind of what they are now. Um, but there's certain, certain restaurants, stores, bars, shops, chiropractors, doctors, doesn't matter. If they accept it, then that cash is good. The benefit to this is the fact that it costs you very little, if anything, to upload your money in there. You can preset your spending limits. And each one of these vendors gets something that they've never gotten before. Two things. They get free transactions, number one. 
So you upload money to the system and I charge you $99.12, I collect $99.12 as the practitioner. What does that do for us? Just take some micro and macro thinking, add 3% to the bottom line of every business in America. Where would you be? How many jobs? Unemployment dumped in half, right? Uh, 10 years ago, companies were fighting against this because the stronghold of the, of the credit card companies on their business was so strangled and so tight. This is where e-currency comes in as a love or a passion for me for this is that, and this is a passion project, this is, I'm in the data business, so um, this is not something I do on a regular basis. I'm speaking on this topic because I thought it was incredibly interesting and I love breaking myths uh, or explaining hustles. So in this, po in this process, these vendors all have the ability to do one thing, important, save more money on transaction. Number two, they get something the credit card companies and the e-commerce and the e-currency companies have been stealing from them for years. Anyone? Ah, now they actually know the information. Do you know that credit card companies charge merchants for information on their customers? What a racket, right? I mean, what, a, what an absolutely ridiculous world we live in. So these closed loop networks uh, years ago were extremely uninteresting to most people because credit card companies are great at marketing and they've got a stronghold on the world. But there's been some companies recently that have come out, one of the most notable being MCX, Merchant Customer Exchange, $15 million in funding to build an app that, by the way, one of our portfolio companies built for about 100 grand. Um, these guys are, are doing something so cool. They've pulled together 240 vendors. Put this here. Oh, by the way, so yeah. Loyalty system, so by the way, the, what do you get for doing this? Sorry about that, I'm, I'm entrepreneurs, are, we are also consumers. Uh, what do we get for this? Now that merchants save money on transactions and they have our data, the cool thing that's happened from big data and from any of these things uh, around the globe is that it gets more specified in our offerings. They're not gonna waste as much of our time. They'll know more about us to be able to offer us the things we have a taste for. They'll be able to offer a social sharing feature uh, that gives you free bonus points through these systems. They'll be able to take into account uh, your taste, your likes and dislikes, and be able to give you the discounts you're looking for. They'll be able to be your credit agency in certain areas. They will extend virtual dollars to allow you to spend money because you know what? Every month you spend about 95 bucks with us. You haven't spent anything this month. What if we give you a $25 credit? They can, they can keep sucking you in. It's a good thing for you because you get free money, you get free information, discounts, free appetizers. It's a great system for all. Uh, but the most important thing with this um, is that the information is now pure, so the savings are passed on to you. 3% more in their pockets, any merchant, they're willing to give up, and I know this because I, I own a piece of a business that does closed loop networks with, with small groups of local vendors, and they donate 1% into local education charities. So instead of feeding Visa or MasterCard, they're donating 1% to making our kids smarter, who by the way are getting dumber on a daily basis. Very good cause for me as, as far as what I believe in. But uh, somebody asked me about this the other day when I was putting together this presentation, and they said, oh, it sounds hokey and you know, cheesy. And I, they said, you know, well, how many people are involved? I go, well, let's just go on M MCX's website. This is just a taste. This is just what I pull off in a few minutes. You've heard of some of these. I mean, these, this is the trend of the future. So building in these networks, not only will I be able to now build in more loyalty and I can fill up with Shell gasoline at, on my way to the yard house to get a drink with a friend and then go have dinner at Chili's while I stop at home and get a, you know, an ice cream cone somewhere, or Baskin Robbins. Not only am I being smarter with my own money, I'm actually being more efficient. I'm funding the economy, I'm funding beneficial things, I'm getting discounts. This is the wave of the future. So to kind of keep it very simple with me um, and who, who, why I'm here, uh, number one, this is a super interesting topic, so thank you for allowing me. Thank you to everybody. This has been very cool. Like, I did not expect this. What a cool place. I feel like I'm uh, filming something important. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but at the same time, like, great speakers, great people. Um, everyone I've met here, great. Just a tremendous area. Um, my business is designed around entrepreneurs, so we are cracking codes, not, not necessarily in every space, but any space that we can find. Uh, breaking them down for data, time management, service, currency. Uh, the Bitcoin model, please just erase it from your mind. It's going to be a, a, a forgotten, well, not forgotten. It'll be a game for gamers uh, forever. But for the normal people in this world, it's not going to affect you too much. If you start seeing these closed loop networks, start using them. Uh, it's a very beneficial thing for our, our, our community, our society, our world. Uh, in your pocket, you save money and you budget yourselves properly. But uh, at the end of the day, data couldn't be more important to currency, which is why e-currency is important to the world. Transferring money from one person to another, 
used to be a mafioso type game. Pay, you're gonna pay me to protect you from me, right? Isn't that what the mob, mob built themselves upon? This is what the credit card industry has been to small business since the existence of credit card industries. Uh, when you start creating closed loop networks, you now break down that barrier and you create an open model between you and the merchant where you can actually do something beneficial. This is E, V, D, any currency you wanna give it. It's virtual, mobile, E, it doesn't matter. That type of system, and, and I think Nplug, you guys will probably, you probably know more about this than I do. Uh, this type of model is what you will see going forward. So uh, very for looking forward to meeting all of you uh, at the networking event here. Um, I'm hoping my voice holds up for a little while longer. I'm much, I usually sound much more eloquent than this, uh, although I do have a little Barry White tonight. Um, but thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it.